The Spin-Off Podcast Network. Are you making the most of your KiwiSaver investment? Generate is an award-winning KiwiSaver provider with a track record of strong long-term performance. Making a smart decision now could add tens of thousands of dollars by the time you reach retirement. Book a no-obligation chat with a Generate KiwiSaver advisor today at generatekiwisaver.co.nz slash advice. A copy of the product disclosure statement is available at generatekiwisaver.co.nz. The issuer of the scheme is Generate Investment Management Limited and, of course, past performance does not guarantee future returns. Host the ultimate backyard barbecue with Whole Foods Market. It's the Hot Grill Summer event through July 16th with sizzling sales on no antibiotics ever boneless beef ribeye steak and beef New York strip steak. Plus, check out sales on sustainable wild-caught Alaska sockeye salmon, organic strawberries, and more. In a hurry? Choose grab-and-go favorites like picnic salads and sushi, plus plenty of cooler-friendly beverages. Make it a hot girl summer at Whole Foods Market. This is Gone by Lunchtime. My name is Toby Manhire. With me today is Annabelle Lee Mather. Kia ora. Kia ora. And uh, Ben Thomas, you're a little late. Well, the logistical issue that we had is that no one can talk to me before I've had my coffee. And so I had to swing by the McDonald's drive through mm-hmm. But now I'm about a third of the way through this delicious medium long black. And we can talk for it. Do you? I've got five kids and I still get here before you. I'm also... You're up early. The listeners deserve to know whether or not you turn up late for your new slots on nine to noon from the left, mm. from the right politics. Do you do you just wander in with a McDonald's coffee when it suits you to that? Obviously not. Well, you, with Radio <laughs> New Zealand, because they Radio New Zealand have a um, they have a roller door in their car park. They've got they're quite security conscious. But there's no sort of button at reception or intercom that can open it, so you have to call the receptionist, and then they run down <laughs> three flights of stairs and <laughs> press the open door. So you've got to be there early for it. I didn't realise with the nine to noon thing, you don't you don't get to go in the main studio. In you just get to just go in the one with the photo of Ka- Catherine Ryan yeah, staring up at you. Yeah, it's just like, it's like just a create a kind of mm. a kind of um, atmosphere, collegial mm. atmosphere. But so I, I need to bring a picture of, I'll get Neil Jones up with on my that, phone. With that famous framed photograph, if you move around the studio, the eyes follow you. It's quite <laughs> quite discomforting. We uh, Thanks also to Jonathan Pierce, who is, as ever, making us sound so beautiful. The last week and a bit has been a lot about pay, so we're going to talk about that. We're also going to talk a bit about um, Hipurpua, and uh, we're going to uncover the, the truth. <laughs> hidden truth on that front. We might talk a bit about Trevor Mallard too. Big shout out to spin-off members who make this whole circus possible. The pay it was a, it was a big week for pay, and uh, I'm still sort of trying to get my head around how it all worked and trying not to overthink it. But we had an announcement by Chris Hopkins, flanked by Grant Robertson, to announce that there would be uh, some some new guidelines for public sector pay and what it definitely wasn't we later learned is it definitely wasn't a freeze um it was quite a sort of i don't know if it was a if it was a rolling story or, or an unraveling or basically the, the they broke it down into three bands and people who are earning under 60,000 can expect to have some healthy pay increases people people who are between 60,000 and 100,000 dollars can expect to have nothing with a few exceptions that's basically the way it was played and people over the 100,000 dollars should are not going to not going to see any increase to their pay that was subsequently described by most people um, including opposition politicians including sporting politicians including commentators including most news reports as a pay freeze Ben. Yeah, I think this was a case of two of the government's most trusted lieutenants to the Prime Minister, Chris Hopkins and Grant Robertson, fucking up what should have been a pretty routine (laughs) announcement. Um, But before public sector bargaining starts, and you've got a few big agreements coming up, you do try and set parameters. 
And it's probably not outrageous to say we're not going to focus all our efforts on bumping up people who are already on six figures, most of whom will be in the core public service, you know, maybe some police mm. with a bunch of allowances, that sort of thing. And, and we're going to concentrate, you know, it's, it's, it's not their turn. It's time for those on lower salaries to sort of start coming up to meet them in the middle. Um, and then that's your starting point for negotiations, as Lila Hare said you know, on, on Twitter. And then you get across the table and you're forced to make concessions like maybe a slight you know, cost of living increase for the teachers or whatever, um, which are all points that the government had to basically walk back to over the week after the announcement. So they'll probably have to give a bit more once they get to the negotiating table. Um, but it, but they did. They allowed this to be seen as, you know, basically, basically ruling anything out rather than just kind of managing expectations for pay rounds. Because there is a worry that, you know, if there's a big settlement in one area of the public service, that's, that starts to set the bar for the next round of negotiations and you get this, what they call a ratchet effect, where it just keeps going up and up and up. Once you get public, spend, uh, public service expenditure, it's basically locked in. You know, it's not like building a road where you build the road and then it's done. It's every year you have that increasing uh, salary expectation. So the, the, the government, through the Public Service Commission as it is now, tries to keep a, a lid on that a little bit and tries to keep it sort of reasonable. So they, they set out their expectations. But, you know, so what, what they were really intending was not a pay freeze so much as a pay cooling of relations. Hey, girl. Oh, my God. Um, Mihi Forbes has just walked into the studio. Mihi Forbes, extremely um, late. Jonathan, can we get a fourth <laughs> microphone? Um, we were talking, uh, Mihi, about the pay freeze, not freeze, that was announced by Chris Hipkins and Grant Robertson. And I wondered when it was announced whether it was the kind of thing that maybe they had focus grouped or thrown around in the room six to nine months ago, where people might have heard, that's right, the public sector needs to take their medicine too. Businesses and people in the private sector are finding it tough, recovering from COVID, but the mood had changed a bit. And so I, it seemed to me they were kind of thought, this is this will be set, you know, like there was all this kind of prudence and it was a lot of, you know, we all need to, at this difficult time, the trouble was it came in the same week where they discovered they've got, had, had many billions more, 5.7 billion more, something like that in the in the kitty. That was bad timing for them. But um, it was interesting because Potter Williams, when she was on The Nation the other day, she had an interesting take on uh, the position that people were taking, and that was that she said to <coughs> Tova, who was interviewing her, that as a caucus, they had really worked hard to protect um, those who earned under 60000 And I thought, oh, mm. that was an interesting take on mm. it. Um, perhaps they hadn't quite considered what 60000 got you these yeah. days, or 60 to, to yeah, 80 and to I th- 90. And, and, th- and I think, and that's true, I think a lot of people think, well, for somebody who's living in somewhere like Wellington or Auckland or a lot of cities around New Zealand who is a an, a nurse or uh, someone who works in the emergency services or whatever who's on 63,000 and has a has a couple of kids and is, that is, they are not a well that is not wealthy mm. and that, that's like literally 1,100 a week before tax so if you're like a solo mum who's a nurse and you've got three or four kids and you are living in Auckland or Wellington that is a tight wage to be living on I think one of the fundamental problems of, of what the government has proposed is that 60000 is way too low. Mm. Those people need to be getting pushed up yeah. as well. Yeah. Yes. So yeah, I mean, but, but, but this all comes back to a, a bigger problem, which they can't address through announcements, which is that New Zealand's a low-wage economy, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So Chris Hipkins valiantly tried to make the point, I think, on RNZ uh, last week that actually nurses are not poor compared to the vast majority of working New Zealanders. You know, he said mo- most teachers, once they reach the top of their sort of pay scale, you know, which is about what, sort of six or seven years in, are on a ni- about 92 grand. We're all poor and together. Actually, <laughs> the, well, I mean, you guys are in TV, right? But, <laughs> yeah. oh, we're smashing it. We're like millionaires, to be fair. <laughs> we were talking yesterday about our fake CEOing jobs that we do, <laughs> where we like cruise around and work 14-hour yeah. days. <laughs> pretending to be like real rich cats. <laughs> I suppose if they did make part of the public sector pay guidance that people who works in, work in comms across the public sector should be paid less, that would be good for journalism. In a well, rather, that's the problem, though. Yeah. That's what I, was, I heard someone the other day talking about, that what happens when you kind of put a put a freeze or whatever you want to call it on, on that sector 
then you know we're just going to be paying more in bins. And more bins. Yeah, more yeah, bins. More the, bins. The, the, the problem Who, with the contracting all over the show. The there, one, one part of the COVID response that's been missing is the fiscal stimulus for PR and communications mm, contractors. That, that, that sector of like <laughs> small yeah. mum and dad. Yeah. Sort you out a select committee. <laughs> but, <laughs> hearing for that. Like, sort of PR serious consultants. Uh, yeah. yeah, like yeah. maybe just, just a, a... Your lives matter too? A have you, a billion billion dollars. Dollars. Like, yeah. Talking about before we started, but have you ever considered going on The Apprentice? If everyone on the everyone on the apprentice is just a is just a marketing person, eh? Uh, they are they and they all social media. Yeah, they're, 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 they're all they're all like <laughs> social media specialists and <laughs> marketing people and um yeah, it's so yeah, no to answer your question I haven't I was rejected. Um the oh. the, the the public said to pay guidance and it was guidance um Annabelle they did end up rolling it back a bit. One of the problems in terms of, and it was it was it was mismanaged, it seems to me. And part of the problem was that you had this furious letter from the PSA coming out, in which they said we'd be apart from apart from being appalled by the the announcement, they said no one no one thought to talk to us about this, which seems kind of dumb, right? Like, which seems pretty dumb for a Labour majority government not to have a conversation. <laughs> With the PSA before they put these the comms and the consultation up. around it was clearly appalling. Um, I, I think another um, interesting point that was made last week is, you know, um, the perception of unfairness from the private sector, and that we've just had. Um, uh, a rise in the minimum wage, n- not enough in my opinion, but but some, and now provision for um, for a new public holiday. So while you know private c- companies are having to find this additional resource to pay their to pay their staff, the government is saying, well, we're not going to increase ours. And uh, the other the other thing too is that. I, I don't think in terms of wider New Zealand there's a lot of resentment around people earning sixty to a hundred thousand dollars. I think when you look at some of the wages the um CEOs of, of um government, you know, ministries and SOEs and that are earning eight hundred thousand at ACC, mm-hmm. you know, those are the Th- those are the sorts of salaries that concern people. I think nickel and diming someone on sixty k supposedly for the benefit of someone on less money seems like strange economics to me. On consultation, they only needed to ask the staff in their office how they feel, how they how they all feel now about their kids' teachers and about the nurses that you know gave them their injections and things like that. Because I think following COVID, you know, um, the relationship that mums and dads have now with Lots of those people who are working in those sixty to hundred um, bracket has really changed. I think that's right. Eh? It's a it's a uniquely sort of favourable mm. climate mm. for you know because normally I think the perception you know or at least the the cliche of the perception of public servants is you know sort of walk shorted bearded dudes striding around Wellington just waiting for retirement basically you know doing the Dom Post quiz for four hours a day <laughs> <laughs> and um, whereas you know post COVID people are thinking no the public sector the, yeah. the ruthlessly efficient people who got me my wage subsidy within 36 hours and mm. um, you know taught my kid over Zoom and mm. you know and, and so it, and which, which I think is also part of why uh, there was such a good reception for the fair pay agreements as well, um, because you know not only do the people who were targeted, you know, by that you know very long-awaited policy, you know, because of COVID, they have a name, essential workers, mm. um, you know, and and nor, and prior to COVID, maybe the middle classes didn't spend a lot of time thinking about why their office was tidy when they arrived in the morning, or <laughs> why they never had to replace toilet rolls. Um, you know, let's who talk was making about their eggs benefit? Let's talk about their fair pay agreement then, because that was an announcement that was made last Friday and got. I think on the whole, uh, much less attention, partly because there was less of a, there was no scrap about the the, the, the vernacular that was used. Um, but was in the scheme of things, a, I think a much a bigger moment. 
It's kind of extraordinary, really, when you think about it, that it's this Saturday marks 30 years since the introduction of the Employment Contracts Act, um, which is covered quite brilliantly by Rebecca McPhee in her new book about Helen Kelly. I'm talking to Rebecca McPhee at the Auckland Writers Festival on Saturday. If you're in the city, come along. A little plug there. But that was introduced... Can I get free tickets? Um, I reckon that you just walk You just walk in. Okay. That was introduced under the leadership of Jim Bolger. Mm. Jim Bolger ran a working group for under a Labour-led government on, uh, em, em, on, em, on employment and working conditions, uh, which came up with the basis for the Fair Pay Agreement, which was announced by Michael Wood on Friday, which is a big deal. I mean, uh, Matt McCartan, who's, 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 who's been around a while, called it the biggest change for industrial relations in a generation. It means that any group of workers uh, across the sector, if they can, if they can get together either a thousand signatures or ten percent of the workforce, mm. can trigger. Uh, one, um, this is this is this is still a, hasn't gone gone into a bill yet, but would then be able to trigger a um, basically an award round. Um, yeah. It's 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 a it's a really a really big deal. Um, is. And is it too cynical just to? talk briefly about the politics again to imagine that the staging of the announcements in that week was we need to show the titan of the belt, the take your medicine attitude with the public sector stuff because boy oh boy there is going to be some blowback from quote unquote the business community when, once we get to the fair pay agreement but the end of the week. I don't know if that was if that was done on purpose but in a funny way I think it it, it makes for a more fertile environment for for it to come in because people um, a they're annoyed at the government for the proposed wage cool down chilly winter vibes mm, mm. Um, not a freeze mm. um, so in some ways it makes it more palatable and you know we live in a society now where our supermarket workers risk a getting stabbed or b dying of COVID so I, I think that maybe for the first time in a couple of generations there's really strong public um, goodwill to this type, for this type of legislation and it's it's we should be capitalising on it ASAP Look, if I had have known you're going to talk about this, <laughs> I probably wouldn't have come. Well, there was, there was an, I agree with Annabelle. <laughs> there was a very, very good column about it in Stuff Today, published in the Dominion Post. Oh, that Ben, that Ben the right. Press. Yeah, I don't think I got off early enough for that one. <laughs> We've already before you arrived. We it's did online. It. We, it's going to be there forever. Oh, did you we spoke like, at about Ben Thomas's today? various media <laughs> obligations. Oh, um, yes. That's the I've stimulus package. I've heard you package. all over the show, to be honest. Yeah. What do you call it? Multiple um, po- portfolios. Of work now. Mm. It's got a very diversified portfolio. There's yeah, and his shilling and <laughs> there, there's, there's scheming and propaganda. Have you got an assistant? Like, how do you keep up? Ba- ba- basically, if anything runs over time, I just like add that to the nine o'clock start time for this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, do you so that's how what, I find more time what, in the what day. What increments oh, do, you okay. do you bill in? Do you bill in twelve minute increments, like a fancy downtown lawyer? Or what I, do you do? No, I, I do fifteen. Fifty? You fifteen? Fifteen? Do you? Wow. Fifteen yeah. minutes? Fifteen oh, minute increments. Wow! Well, if we did what fifteen minutes, vibes. imagine if we did fifteen minutes. We'd people, be would be multi thousand years. We'd be multi thousand years, and <clears throat> actually, people would go out of business. <laughs> people would be Salt with them, out of business they have no money left. Um, that's that's the plan. You were saying, you were saying, Ben. Uh, oh yeah. So there's, I mean, there's a couple of ways you could s- slice it that the government could have plausibly come to announcing both these things in one week. For, you know, from a comms point of view, they might they might have been thinking, well, both of these are part of our general thrust of trying to raise wages, but from the bottom. So sort of the opposite of trickle down economics. We're trying to raise wages at the bottom. We're doing that by one concentrating on the lower paid public service um, in this wage round, and also we're trying to lift wages across those sort of mm. vulnerable worker sectors. So I, I don't know that too much strategy sort of went into it. You know, I, th- I think people sometimes overthink the timing of these things. They had to get the wage round stuff out of the way before bargaining started uh, and before the budget when people would sort of see that there wasn't a lot sort of in the baseline <laughs> put aside for um, pay increases. And uh, the fair pay agreements, they probably just wanted to to also get out of the way because that needed uh, that would have need budget, budget money um, attached to it as well. It could end up being the most important piece of legislation this government passes, I think, eh? It, it, it's huge. I used to yeah. work in employment law and 
the, what we saw, the, so the Employment Contract Act, just in case anyone listening to this is not as old as us, the Employment Contract Act, which came in in 1991, prior to that, there was all almost de facto compulsory unionism in New Zealand. Like, not, not quite. Well, no, but no, there had been, there had been, yeah. for, but it had slipped to her quite long. But, mm. but it was, in, in 1979, just because this was a fact I got out of Rebecca's book that I've been <laughs> reading recently, there were 570 strikes. Yeah. Like that's the kind of the it's, it's an Great incredible times. thing. <laughs> it's the best of times. <laughs> but but like in, that. the the fair pay agreement is actually a, is, sort of goes back to an even older uh, pre seventies. Uh, so when National have been saying, oh, it's back to the seventies, it's actually older than the seventies. This is going back to the compulsory arbitration system. So you're not allowed to strike in support of a fair pay agreement. But if you can't reach agreement with the the employer representatives from that sector, it gets referred to the Employment Relations Authority, which is a dinky little (laughs) tribunal that does sort of dismissals and personal grievances in a sort of meeting room somewhere, and they'll just set the terms for the the minimum terms uh, for the fair pay agreement for that sector. Now, we haven't had compulsory arbitration uh, in any any sector apart from the police for a long, long time. The police have got this interesting part of their contract where if they, if their union can't reach agreement with uh, with the police itself on um, on pay, basically the two of them put e- each submit a proposal to an independent arbitrator, and then he has to choose one of them. And in effect, what that means is that they sort of converge together. This is going to be, I think, different from that, which is going to be the the Employment Relations Authority member can just sort of set the terms, probably from a range of things that are submitted by the different parties from their bargaining. But that, that's a huge thing, because if you, like in Wellington, for, now, for example, right now, we saw NZ Bus were mm. perfectly willing to basically starve out <laughs> the unions, mm. lock them out, you know, put them off their shift so they they mm. don't have they don't have money coming in um, to to wait out the bargaining and and sort of force them to accept whatever the employer was okay. wanting, which which they won't be able to do under the fair pay agreements. So this is actually an incredibly powerful tool that's been given to the unions. Mm. Yeah, and one that that that, um, that had been fought for over 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 decades, really. You know, it is. It is I mean, I mean, to, to repeat myself, it's kind of staggering to think that as Jim Bolger <laughs> who did it. It's you know, it's he's coming in strong with the socialism vibes, eh? So much, um, you know, and we there he's were, like he, the, the Che Guevara of, of Waikato, of that, totally, yeah, <laughs> of the King Country. Yeah. Yes. It's, um, it's something to should behold. hear his treaty talk these Could days. Hear me? This is gone by lunchtime. We'll be back in a moment. Host the ultimate backyard barbecue with Whole Foods Market. It's the hot grill summer event through July 16th with sizzling sales on no antibiotics ever boneless beef ribeye steak and beef New York strip steak. Plus, check out sales on sustainable wild caught Alaska sockeye salmon, organic strawberries, and more. In a hurry? Choose grab-and-go favorites like picnic salads and sushi, plus plenty of cooler-friendly beverages. Make it a hot girl summer at Whole Foods Market. I'm Toby Manhire, and this is Juggernaut, the story of the fourth Labour government. A podcast in six parts. Doesn't give my opponents much time to run up a total election, does it? This nation is at risk. What do you think you're up to now, you perverted little liar? I can smell the uranium on it as you lean towards the <laughs> There's radical overhaul in the history of New Zealand's administration. Juggernaut, the story of the fourth Labour government. Made with the support of New Zealand On Air. Listen now on the spin-off or wherever you get your podcasts. Speaking of insurrectionists... We're going to talk about here Puapua, which is clearly a manifesto for a complete um, takeover of the country, Annabelle. Indeed, it's our secret plan to get um, Pākehā New Zealanders to cede sovereignty mm. to Māori because clearly most of them are tired of being in charge of New Zealand and don't like having te noranga te ratanga over their lives and want us to be the bosses of everything. So we're, yeah. we're here for it. We're yeah, talking, of course, times. about a paper that was put together by a group of academics, um, which followed New Zealand signing up to the UN Declaration, Declaration on Indigenous Peoples, is it? And um, then that, that process began under the last national government and then the last Labour government commissioned this report. And uh, like a lot of reports, 
<laughs> it's sort of been in a pile, I think, of reports. Uh, first, the ACT Party discovered the report, and um, then since uh, the National Party, led by Judith Collins, has um, been running a line using words like segregation and separation. Racial separatism. Racial separatism. Um, Actually, racist, racist separatism, separatism was racist. her description. Okay. Um, but there was more about the Māori Health Authority, but yes, you know, tomatoes, Maori tomatoes. Health, which is, yeah, which is, was part of the big health reforms that were announced <coughs> a couple of weeks ago now. On uh, the television programme The Hui, which is on show. what is it? Facebook now? Is it, I don't know. Where is it? Where is it? I watched it on Facebook. Yeah. It's, it's, it's still on. It's still on, on, the, still on the television. Is it? Yeah. Well, it's tele- on the television after News Hub late on oh, yeah. Monday oh, yeah. evenings. So if you've got uh, a like television, then no. Mm, well, like well, depends, o'clock. depends, okay. sometimes 10.30 okay. well. And then it's 8.30 live on newshub.co.nz You can also watch it on the Facebook there And, and you, we're still in our Sunday slot on 9.30 oh, as well great. So we're, every, great. we're I mean, this, we're part of Her Pua Pua So essentially, we're, we're just, general, eventually it'll just be yeah. 24-7 The Hui <laughs> playing on TV every, every, now and then, every now and then I'm slipping across to the nation Yeah, it's oh, all part yeah. of why, why why is You are the masked singer on I the nation I am the masked Mahi's also the masked, the masked interrogator. She's actually all of the contestants on The Masked Singer. I hope I didn't I'm give away the, the plot there. But this <laughs> I am the tortata, the I am the sheep and the pavlova. Mm. <laughs> it's, it's like performance poetry. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's great. I love it. It's beautiful. And I'm using all of my skills. And you used all of your skills. Mahingarangi Forbes, when you interviewed Judith Collins on the Hui, how did that go? Tell us about that. Well, it was a very, um, it was a very, um, I don't know, a lot of information. Oh yeah, I didn't get a lot of information out. Mm. We were just trying to establish the treaty, really. Did, did she get much information from you about Hipopo? <laughs> no, because I'm not a writer of Hipopo, but I did see this straight a few times on just the who was part of the treaty, who signed the treaty. Yeah, no, it was an interesting um, interview. It was a little bit hard because we crossed to her in Wellington, mm. and when you do one of those crosses, you have a you know a, a, a delay, bit of a delay. Mm. and so it can mm. be a little bit hard when you're trying to interject mm. or whatever because mm. it just you end up with a lot of sort of cross talk, but. Um, but essentially what Judith Collins is calling for is a national conversation on he pua pua. Mm. As someone tweeted, what is a national conversation, please, and thank you. be good to have a bit of an explanation mm. about okay. that. But, but on just, I mean, notwithstanding the hoary cliche of a national conversation, is it so terrible that people read he pua pua and have a discussion about he pua pua and the indi- ideas that are in it? No, that's fine. I mean, I think, uh, I'm going back to the question that you asked me, <clears throat> what did we get out of it? I think that one of the lines that, that Judith Collins runs is just who is part of the treaty. And so I think that it would be, <clears throat> before we actually talk about he pua pua, let's have a conversation about mm. te tiriti mm. and what that means for us because we're actually all working in these partnership frameworks and they're all interwoven through this government, the last government. I mean, for goodness sake, the Uriwera Bill is uh, basically the national government through uh, Chris Finlayson, and correct me because you probably know more about the bill than me, is literally taking that ngahiri, that forest, out of government hands and putting it into an, an iwi authority. So, um, but it became a legal person. Became mm. a legal person under... She. She became she, a legal person. Yes, koe, te ngahiri, uh, te uriwera. So, you know, we've been working within these frameworks for a very long time now, so so then when you have start having this discussion around what the treaty is and who the treaty partners are, and starting to push that out to our Pacific cousins and other people and other minorities that live in New Zealand, then that's a very dangerous space, mm. and so we have to get right back. If we're going to have a conversation about he pua pua, let's have a conversation about the treaty and what that means for us. Yes, because in the, in I mean, what you meant to the, the, some of the discussion seems to be predicated uh, in some people's mind on the idea that the treaty was basically an endpoint, <laughs> like as if a, as if it's mm. kind of now we're all now we've sorted that, and we'll all just. You know, be one people, the one, mm. one, the one, the one people, one law for all thing. Yes. That seems to be a, well, she a did, point she, of quite strong difference. When, when she gave her speech to her delegates a couple of weeks ago, I think it was she talked the Northern about Northern Conference, yeah, yeah um, Kawanatanga, and she referred to our relationship with the Queen. Uh, she talked about 
rangatiratanga, and she talked about property rights, which was interesting. And then she talked about ori tanga, which she talked about everyone having the same, you know, it's about fairness and need. And she included not just Māori and tangata, whenua and tangata tiriti. She talks about all New Zealanders, and she actually specifically names um, different groups of people. So um, I think that that's her... her under, that's how she's describing the treaty at the at the moment and I think the Rangatiratanga one is interesting because she specifically talks about property rights and actually in that discussion alone when you talk about property rights then it becomes about how old is our claim to the property right because mm. you know are we going right back to 1863 when the Crown came and took 1.3 million uh, acres of land from Waikato or are we talking about the property right of like just in the last 20 years because you can't have so you can't make those claims unless you're going to, uh, if it, unless it's going to go all the way back to 1840. Anyway, that's where I think the discussion needs to be had. Um, I, I listened to um, Willie Jackson's interview on RNZ, RNZ this week, just coming back to your question about why shouldn't all New Zealanders read He Pua Pua. And um, he said that um, the concern was that it would be um, politicised and um, used to ramp up um, anxiety about issues such as we've seen discussed this week by Judith. Mm. Do I think all New Zealanders should read He Pua Pua? I think it should be compulsory reading, but I also think that you need to do a little bit of homework beforehand and understand what it actually, what the Te Tiriti really means, what treaty partnership really means, and also an understanding that, like Judith did, on, like Ms. Ms Collins did on Monday evening, you can refer all you like to democracy, but there's no democracy in New Zealand that isn't predicated on Te Tiriti because it was Te Tiriti that gave um, the government the right to be established here in the first place to exercise democracy. So, yes, but it has to come hand in hand. Otherwise, you won't understand it. I don't think anyone should read Hepu because I read it and it was very dull. <laughs> um, I, I forced myself through the whole thing. When you actually get down to what Hepu was, it was basically a group of academics thrown together to, to sort of th- blue sky think about what would New Zealand have to do to reach its... Uh, its its obligations under the I must say very voluntary mm. <laughs> UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Long People biting. or mm. UN DRIP as we like to call it, and they they got together for about two weeks I think. So this is all just the thoughts they basically already had on how you would sort of ex- give full expression to you know what's in the what's in the drip, and then they put together a stock take of things that you could point to that New Zealand's already done that would be getting it closer to the drip. Mm. I actually think politically, I think it's a terrible idea to tie any of this to the UN stuff um, because New Zealand has a treaty. We don't we don't need a UN declaration. Like we've got a treaty and we're busy enough trying to figure out what that means and what partnership means going forward without bringing the fucking UN and Bahrain and whatever into it, right? And he, he, he pua, I, I mean, I, I, I think, like, Willie Jackson's totally right that it was going to be used that way, mm-hmm. it, but it was always going to be used that way. And the government's got to take some responsibility for not just shutting it down and saying, this was just a think piece, yep, we'll add it to the pile of stuff that we're thinking about. Because this is not actually where the action is. When the When the Department of Conservation, uh, you know, those papers were leaked supposedly to Judith Collins saying that, you know, in essence that Doc wants to consult with Iwi more and see how they can get local Māori involved in conservation areas, right? This isn't part of some UN Illuminati plot. This is because Doc lost a court case two years ago that went that they mm. appealed and appealed that went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court's and and the basis for this was tours of Motatapu Island in Auckland. Fullers did tours of it, had been doing tours of it for years and years and years. There was uh, the Tamaki Makoto Treaty Settlement, which gave. Um, mm. Naitai Kitamaki uh, acknowledged their historical relationship to the island. Naitai came came along with a proposal and said, we'd like to do some tours. 
And Doc said, "Oh no, we're happy with Fuller's, thanks." Mm. And you know, and they review they they sought judicial review of that decision, and the court said. Doc was breaching its legislation, mm. and so Doc now Doc is now doing a stock take of all of its relationships with Ewe and how it, you know, and 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 basically it just boils down to you've just got to do, you you just got to talk to people. You just got to try and have partnership where you can. Like, you know, a million years ago there was the Kaikoura whale watching case, which established the duty to consult, uh, you know, the duty of the Crown and local councils to consult with iwi um, where relevant. And I think consultation became a bit of a checklist and a bit of a box-ticking exercise. So what it seems to me is that the courts basically just periodically kind of refresh the obligation to remind people that it's actually got to be something more than just checking off things on your list and going through the motions and you actually do need to engage with the treaty partner because that's what not you know it's what the treaty says but then the treaty has been incorporated into law and it wasn't recent and it wasn't because of hepuapua it's been going since the 80s under labor governments national governments because that's the founding document of New Zealand and it creates better outcomes. And, and just FYI, you Hobson pledge people, Hobson's pledge people, um, he iwi kotahi tato doesn't mean um, Pākehā get to subsume Māori. It means that we work together. That's what that's what that means from a Māori interpretation. And I think a lot of this isn't particularly... You know, people don't have it in their in their heads. You know, who are the treaty partners? It's not. It's not as I think um, Ardern said in Australia between Pakeha and Maori. <laughs> They're not the treaty partners. The treaty partners are the Crown and Iwi slash Hapu. Mm. I think um, I've been thinking a, little, a lot about in the last little while, given the whole pu- he pua pua discourse, the relationships that because you know what we're talking about here is partnerships and relationships and some of us do relationships and partnerships better than others and so I was thinking about all of these really positive um, outcomes that have come from you know um, Chris Finlayson's work in the National Party um, um, you know certain iwi that have worked better with the Crown to achieve some really amazing outcomes and just about how those architects of the architects of those um, kaupapa must be feeling at the moment when it's kind of all being torn torn down and sh- shredded I, yeah I, th- th- that's right like it, it <laughs> like I, I f- first of all you know I think that you know we saw that um, Rawari Waititi co-leader of Te Pāti Māori um, had, has, has been, she been having a number of stouches in Parliament mm. over this um, you know, talking about racism, saying we need to call label racism in Parliament. I actually think all of that stuff's pretty counterproductive. You know, Don Brash didn't start going up in the polls after Rod Ewer until the debate shifted away from his absolutely zero evidence of special treatment towards a debate of, is Don Brash a racist? Um, and that's when people started getting emotionally involved in all of this. But so I think politically it's counterproductive, but it it is. It's so like it's so dispiriting when you see how when you see you know the incredible work that people like Tamati Kruger uh, and Tuhoi have done. People like you know Harmi Pitipi, You know these people, Sir Tiffany O'Deegan, People you know across Actually, the country have done anyone, inc- all of them, yeah, everyone who all, works on a yeah. Maori trust board or a runa is working mostly yeah. for free. Yeah. And um, while the doc and all the other people that they're consulting with are on full pays, everyone else is working literally in their spare time after their other job and putting all their kids to sleep. So. It's, yeah, it's, we're still working in inequities, if you like. We're meant to have had this big, you know, payout, but there's actually not much money. And 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 none of these people have ever approached their task with the goal of taking over New Zealand and subjugating white people. And it's so frustrating for that kind of implied narrative that you know <laughs> that all of these all of these people out working in their communities, working with you know people, you know, trying to create jobs, trying to create better health outcomes that somehow that's a threat to the average national mm. voter. And it's it's so frustrating. And I, we used to see this, you know, when I worked in Finlayson's office um, because we were doing treaty settlements. You'd see this all the time. People, people, you know, genuinely, genuinely nice, kind-hearted people who just didn't really know what was going on. They would get a Hobson's Pledge flyer or whatever it was called back then because these groups just keep rebirthing. Mm. And they would start panicking and thinking that because there was a treaty settlement in their area that their farm was going to be confiscated and, you know, and it's 
just it just does my head in. You know these debates, quote unquote, mm. uh, you know, can really cause a lot of harm. Mm. And I think that the danger, of course, is that um, you know people. You know, well, it's satisfying to kind of go full bore at the national party. Say, if you're um, Howard Waititi, it doesn't necessarily create the best outcome overall. No, um, it's it's interesting because that relationship between the Maori Party and the National Party looks looks like it could never ever be fixed. And they Imagine never, the, yeah, the thought of it. The thought <laughs> of it, and actually, it wasn't that long ago that yeah. they were all sitting yeah. at the same table, yeah. as yeah. the Uru used to say it, yeah. um, and working quite well together. <coughs> yeah. um, and so probably... And John Key was super keen to and, have and the Maori what, Party Could that possibly and, have been National's like, yeah. best um, partner? Was... Uh, th- they, they were okay. They actually, the Māori Party actually, even when they were a support party of the key government, they voted against the government slightly more than they voted for the government. Mm-hmm. But what they did do was support key on things that ACT was against. So they were they were, they were a very important part um, of that government, even though they actually ended up siding with Labour on losing votes for the opposition more often than not. It's actually interesting that you say that because I, I think there's a very good possibility that the Māori Party and the National Party could work together again because as I think... As not th- yesterday. <laughs> not, not, not next week. Not, well, no, as, not tomorrow. As, as I think everyone's canvas, I, you know, this is not an election-winning strategy. You, know, you can't get centrist voters on this kind of strategy. Judith Collins is not going to win the ele- next election, and in fact, Judith Collins may not make Stabbing it. Still, having a election. steroid injection into your it's, that's body, right. It's, it's, it? a, it's a Jason Statham crank too, yeah. just sort of like just keeping going, just trying to <laughs> stay alive for another day. And just like just like when what happened with Brash, when Luxon or whoever takes over, they they will then tack away and oh. go. We are the new National Party. We are going to be better treaty partners. You know, and the, we, yeah. we're, we're, look, we're putting it in the mm. constitution. You can fly the Maori flag on government buildings on Waitangi Day, and we'll have a Christopher yeah, Luxon yeah, will cr- cr- cruise over to Mount Roskill and pick up somebody to pick up a child to take to Waitangi, you know, <laughs> and kidnap, yeah. kidnap a child, right. yeah. put down a hanging. Yeah. He'll dispatch his handlers. Yeah. <laughs> He'll carry her, <laughs> carry her along the foreshore, yeah. no, dragging a tummy yeah. along the coast yeah. at Waitangi Screaming. as part of the new Air New Zealand. Safety. <laughs> What's um, happened to that young woman? I don't know. She moved to Australia. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what was her name? Um, we have we've run out of time. Yeah, was, we were going yeah. to talk it about. It wasn't actually Aroha, um, but it became Aroha. Oh, right. oh, really? <laughs> go on, cool, go. We come were going to talk on, about Trevor Mella, but we've run out of time and you've got meetings to go to, people to see. We do. Um, CEOs. Uh, CEOs. Uh, CEOs to consult with. The main thing about Trevor Mella, which we all return to, but there's been a lot of stuff in the news, the thing with um, Rawi Waititi being injected, obviously the kind of uh, volatile exchanges with Chris Bishop. Um, but, In summary, but mostly, you can say rape, but you can't say racist. The end. No? We still go? No, no, I was just okay. going to say that the really important thing was that he sent a mean tweet to Ben Thomas, <gasps> and that was that was the, I mean, do you just want to have, like, two sentences was in, it, in your um, defence on that Ben before we say goodbye? Was it a private message or out there? No, it was, it was just a. It was just an at reply, which um, misunderstood my tweet. But this is, this is normal. Like it was a correction. He corrected you. No, he didn't. He, well, yeah, but he was wrong with his correction. But he he was incorrectly was correcting he? me. Well, right. at least he's at least he's consistent. He corrected <laughs> me once too. Because <laughs> the thing is, Ma- Mallard he likes to correct you. Mallard, he's, he loves he's, a, tweet. he's a good guy. He's a good guy, and he's a very good minister. He's fancies. But he yep. went absolutely Funsies. insane in opposition because he had nothing to do, and he just became this weird old Twitter crank. And since he's I remember that. since he's been speaker. You know, obviously the gravitas of the office, but you know it still persists in the system. He's a bit of a long hauler, you know, and so sometimes <laughs> it just, sometimes it just pops out, and he's like, "I just got to get in amongst the action." <laughs> uh, this is gone by lunchtime. Alex Casey, senior writer at The Spin-Off. We wouldn't exist without the ongoing support of our generous members. If you're able to, you can make a donation at thespinoff.co.nz slash donate. Do you find it hard staying optimistic with all the financial news in the media? I'm Bernard Hickey, and on my podcast, When the Facts Change, I'm here to help you navigate the ever-changing landscape 
of economics in Aotearoa. So join the conversation every Friday on When the Facts Change, brought to you by the Spin-Off Podcast Network in partnership with KiwiBank. The Spin-Off Podcast Network.